Dread Familiar. Good evening, and welcome to the Dread Familiar episode 9. I'd like to start out right off the bat tonight saying thanks for listening. Thanks to everyone who has contributed to the show. If you want to contribute a story or a voice audition, it is submissions at thedreadfamiliar.com. Please give this show a like, a share, an upvote, a follow, uh, a good rating. Any of those things help me out a lot, and I very much appreciate it. Tonight I'm taking things in a slightly different direction with a pair of fairy tales originally put into writing by the Brothers Grimm. The stories recorded by the brothers in the early 19th century were tales of folklore, at the time only existing in the minds of the people and passed down orally. Some served the simple purpose of entertainment, but some included harsh lessons and veered quite hard into the realm of the terrible and horrific. Of course, any fan of horror knows that many of the original fairy tales that we're familiar with in their modern, animated form have a darker origin. Yet many of us have never actually taken the time to sit down and read these stories. So, although it's been done before, I'd like to present to you one very popular tale, and one that is much less commonly known. Murder, cannibalism, and the devil himself all appear in this classic fairy tale, The Juniper Tree, by Jacob and Wilhelm Grimm. Long ago, at least 2,000 years, there was a rich man who had a beautiful and pious wife, and they loved each other dearly. However, they had no children, though they wished very much to have some, and the woman prayed for them day and night, but they didn't get any, and they didn't get any. In front of their house, there was a courtyard where there stood a juniper tree. One day in winter, the woman was standing beneath it, peeling herself an apple. And while she was thus peeling the apple, she cut her finger, and the blood fell into the snow. Oh, said the woman. She sighed heavily, looked at the blood before her, and was most unhappy. If only I had a child as red as blood and as white as snow. And as she said that, she became quite contented, and felt sure that it was going to happen. Then she went into the house, and a month went by, and the snow was gone, and two months, and everything was green, and three months, and all the flowers came out of the earth, and four months, and all the trees in the woods grew thicker, and the green branches were all entwined in one another and the birds sang until the woods resounded and the blossoms fell from the trees. Then the fifth month passed, and she stood beneath the juniper tree, which smelled so sweet that her heart jumped for joy, and she fell on her knees and was beside herself. And when the sixth month was over, the fruit was thick and large, and then she was quite ill. And after the seventh month, she picked the juniper berries and ate them greedily. Then she grew sick and sorrowful. Then the eighth month passed, and she called her husband to her and cried, and said, If I die, then bury me beneath the juniper tree. And she was quite comforted and happy until the next month was over. And then she had a child as white as snow and as red as blood, and when she saw it, she was so happy that she died. Her husband buried her beneath the juniper tree, and he began to cry bitterly. After some time he was more at ease, and although he still cried, he could bear it. And some time later, he took another wife. He had a daughter by the second wife, but the first wife's child was a little son, and he was as red as blood and as white as snow. When the woman looked at her daughter, she loved her very much, but then she looked at the little boy, and it pierced her heart, for she thought that he would always stand in her way, and she was always thinking how she could get the entire inheritance for her daughter. And the evil one filled her mind with this until she grew very angry with the little boy, and she pushed him from one corner to the other, and slapped him here and cuffed him there 
until the poor child was always afraid. For when he came home from school, there was nowhere he could find any peace. One day the woman had gone upstairs to her room, when her little daughter came up too and said, Mother, give me an apple. Yes, my child, said the woman, and gave her a beautiful apple out of the chest. The chest had a large, heavy lid with a sharp iron lock. Mother, said the little daughter, is brother not to have one too? This made the woman angry, but she said, Yes, when he comes home from school. When from the window she saw him coming, it was as though the evil one came over her, and she grabbed the apple and took it away from her daughter, saying, You shall not have one before your brother. She threw the apple into the chest and shut it. Then the little boy came to the door, and the evil one made her say to him kindly, My son, do you want an apple? And she looked at him fiercely. Mother, said the little boy, how angry you look. Yes, give me an apple. Then it seemed to her as if she had to persuade him. Come with me, she said, opening the lid of the chest. Take out an apple for yourself. And while the little boy was leaning over, the evil one prompted her. And crash! She slammed down the lid, and his head flew off, falling among the red apples. Then fear overcame her, and she thought, Maybe I can get out of this. So she went upstairs to her room, to her chest of drawers, and took a white scarf out of the top drawer, and set the head upon the neck again, tying the scarf around it so that nothing could be seen. Then she set him on a chair in front of the door, and put the apple in his hand. After this, Marlene came into the kitchen to her mother, who was standing by the fire with a pot of hot water before her, which she was stirring around and around. Mother, said Marlene, brother is sitting at the door, and he looks totally white and has an apple in his hand. I asked him to give me the apple, but he did not answer me. I was very frightened. Go back to him, said her mother, and if he will not answer you, then box his ears. So Marlene went to him and said, Brother, give me the apple. But he was silent, so she gave him one on the ear, and his head fell off. Marlene was terrified and began crying and screaming and ran to her mother and said, Oh, mother, I've knocked my brother's head off. And she cried and cried and could not be comforted. Marlene, said the mother, what have you done? Be quiet and don't let anyone know about it. It cannot be helped now. We will cook him into stew. And the mother took to the little boy and chopped him into pieces, put him into the pot, and cooked him into stew. But Marlene stood by, crying and crying, and all her tears fell into the pot, and they did not need any salt. Then the father came home and sat down at the table and said, Where is my son? And the mother served up a large, large dish of stew, and Marlene cried and could not stop. And the father said again, Where is my son? Oh, said the mother, He has gone across the country to his mother's great uncle. He will stay there a while. What is he doing there? He did not even say goodbye to me. Oh, he wanted to go and asked me if he could stay six weeks. He will be well taken care of there. Oh, said the man. I'm unhappy. It isn't right. He should have said goodbye to me. With that, he began to eat, saying, Marlene, why are you crying? Your brother will certainly come back. Then he said, Wife, this food is delicious. Give me some more. And the more he ate, the more he wanted, and he said, Give me some more. You two shall have none of it. It seems to me as if it were all mine. And he ate and ate, throwing all the bones under the table, 
until he had finished it all. Marlene went to her chest of drawers, took her best silk scarf from the bottom drawer, and gathered all the bones from the beneath the table, and tied them up in her silk scarf, and carried them outside the door, crying tears of blood. She laid them down beneath the juniper tree on the green grass, and after she had put them there, she suddenly felt better and did not cry any more. Then the juniper tree began to move. The branches moved apart, then moved together again, just as if someone were rejoicing and clapping his hands. At the same time, a mist seemed to rise from the tree, and in the center of this mist it burned like a fire, and a beautiful bird flew out of the fire, singing magnificently, and it flew high into the air, and when it was gone, the juniper tree was just as it had been before, and the cloth with the bones was no longer there. Marlene, however, was as happy and contented as if her brother were still alive, and she went merrily into the house, sat down at the table, and ate. Then the bird flew away and lit on a goldsmith's house and began to sing. My mother, she killed me. My father, he ate me. My sister, Marlene, gathered all my bones, tied them in a silken scarf, laid them beneath the juniper tree. Tweet, tweet, what a beautiful bird am I. The goldsmith was sitting in his workshop making a gold chain when he heard the bird sitting on his roof and singing. The song seemed very beautiful to him. He stood up, but as he crossed the threshold, he lost one of his slippers. However, he went right up to the middle of the street with only one slipper and one sock on. He had his leather apron on, and in one hand he had a golden chain, and in the other his tongs. The sun was shining brightly on the street. He walked onward, then stood still, and said to the bird, Bird, he said, how beautifully you can sing. Sing that piece again for me. No, said the bird. I do not sing twice for nothing. Give me the golden chain, and then I will sing it again for you. The goldsmith said, Here is the golden chain for you. Now sing that song again for me. Then the bird came back and took the golden chain in his right claw, and went and sat in front of the goldsmith and sang, My mother, she killed me. My father, he ate me. My sister, Marlene, gathered all my bones, tied them in a silken scarf, laid them beneath a juniper tree. Tweet, tweet, what a beautiful bird am I. Then the bird flew away to a shoemaker, and lit on his roof and sang, My mother, she killed me. My father, he ate me. My sister Marlene gathered all my bones, tied them in a silken scarf, laid them beneath the juniper tree. Tweet, tweet, what a beautiful bird am I. Hearing this, the shoemaker ran out of doors in his shirt sleeves, and looked up at his roof, and had to hold his hand in front of his eye to keep the sun from blinding him. Bird, he said, how beautifully you can sing. Then he called in at his door. Wife, come outside, there's a bird here. Look at this bird, he certainly can sing. Then he called his daughter, and her children, and the journeyman, and the apprentice, and the maid. And they all came out into the street and looked at the bird and saw how beautiful he was and what fine red and green feathers he had, and how his neck was like pure gold, and how his eyes shone like stars in his head. Bird, said the shoemaker. Now sing that song again for me. No, said the bird. I do not sing twice for nothing. You must give me something. Wife, said the man. Go into the shop. There's a pair of red shoes on the top shelf. Bring them down. And the wife went and brought the shoes. There, bird, said the man. Now sing that piece again for me. Then the bird took the shoes in his left claw and flew back to the roof and sang. My mother, she killed me. My father, he ate me. My sister, Marlene, gathered all my bones. Tied them in a silken scarf. 
laid them beneath the juniper tree. Tweet, tweet, what a beautiful bird am I. When he had finished his song, he flew away. In his right claw, he had the chain, and in his left one, the shoes. He flew far away to a mill, and the mill went clickety-clack, clickety-clack, clickety-clack. In the mill sat twenty miller's apprentices cutting a stone and chiseling chip-chop, chip-chop, chip-chop. And the mill went clickety-clack, clickety-clack, clickety-clack. Then the bird went and sat on a linden tree which stood in front of the mill and sang, My mother, she killed me. Then one of them stopped working. My father, he ate me. Then two more stopped working and listened. My sister, Marlene. Then four more stopped, gathered all my bones, tied them in a silken scar. Now only eight were chiseling, laid them beneath. Now only five, the juniper tree. Now only one, tweet, tweet, what a beautiful bird am I. Then the last one stopped also and heard the last words. Bird, said he, how beautifully you sing. Let me hear that too. Sing it for me once more. No, said the bird. I do not sing twice for nothing. Give me the millstone, and then I will sing again. Yes, he said. If it belonged only to me, you should have it. Yes, said the others. If he sings again, he can have it. Then the bird came down and the twenty millers took a beam and lifted the stone up. Yo heave ho, yo heave ho, yo heave ho. The bird stuck his neck through the hole and put the stone on as if it were a collar, then flew to the tree again and sang, My mother she killed me, my father he ate me, my sister Marlene gathered all my bones, tied them in a silken scarf, laid them beneath the juniper tree, tweet, tweet, What a beautiful bird am I. When he was finished singing, he spread his wings, and in his right claw he had the chain, and in his left one the shoes, and around his neck the millstone. He flew far away to his father's house. In the room, the father, the mother, and Marlene were sitting at the table. The father said, I feel so contented. I am so happy. Not I said the mother. I feel uneasy, just as if a bad storm were coming. But Marlene sat and just cried and cried. Then the bird flew up, and as it seated itself on the roof, the father said, Oh, I feel so truly happy, and the sun is shining so beautifully outside. I feel as if I were about to see some old acquaintance again. Not I, said the woman. I am so afraid that my teeth are chattering and I feel like I have fire in my veins. And she tore open her bodice even more. Marlene sat in a corner crying. She held a handkerchief before her eyes and cried until it was wet clear through. Then the bird seated itself on the juniper tree and sang, My mother, she killed me. The mother stopped her ears and shut her eyes, not wanting to see or hear But there was a roaring in her ears like the fiercest storm, and her eyes burned and flashed like lightning. My father, he ate me. Oh, mother, said the man, that is a beautiful bird. He is singing so splendidly, and the sun is shining so warmly, and it smells like pure cinnamon. My sister Marlene. Then Marlene laid her head on her knees and cried and cried, but the man said, I'm going out. I must see the bird up close. Oh, don't go, said the woman. I feel as if the whole house were shaking and on fire. But the man went out and looked at the bird. Gathered all my bones, tied them in a silken scarf, laid them beneath the juniper tree. Tweet, tweet, what a beautiful bird am I. With this, the bird dropped the golden chain, and it fell right around the man's neck, so exactly around it that it fit beautifully. Then the man went in and said, Just look at what a beautiful bird that is, and what a beautiful golden chain he has given me, and how nice it looks. 
but the woman was terrified. She fell down on the floor in the room, and her cap fell off her head. Then the bird sang once more. My mother, she killed me. I wish I were a thousand fathoms beneath the earth so I would not have to hear that. My father, he ate me. Then the woman fell down as if she were dead. My sister, Marlene. Oh, said Marlene. I too will go out and see if the bird will give me something. Then she went out. Gathered all my bones. Tied them in a silken scarf. He threw the shoes down to her. Made them beneath the juniper tree. Tweet, tweet. What a beautiful bird am I. Then she was contented and happy. She put on the new red shoes and danced and leaped into the house. Oh, she said, I was so sad when I went out, and now I am so contented. That is a splendid bird. He has given me a pair of red shoes. No, said the woman, jumping to her feet with her hair standing up like flames of fire. I feel as if the world were coming to an end, too. I will go out and see if it makes me feel better. And as she went out the door, crash! The bird threw the millstone on her head, and it crushed her to death. The father and Marlene heard it and went out too. Smoke, flames, and fire were rising from the place. And when that was over, the little brother was standing there, and he took his father and Marlene by the hand, and all three were very happy. And they went into the house, sat down at the table, and ate. The next story is one you've undoubtedly heard before, yet it is no less shocking in its succinct, almost careless handling of threats of murder and kidnapping, as well as the unresisted gifting of a daughter to a king. This is Rumpelstiltskin. Once there was a miller who was poor, but who had a beautiful daughter. Now it had happened that he had to go and speak to the king. And in order to make himself appear important, he said to him, I have a daughter who can spin straw into gold. The king said to the miller, That is an art which pleases me well. If your daughter is as clever as you say, bring her tomorrow to my palace, and I will put her to the test. And when the girl was brought to him, he took her into a room which was quite full of straw, gave her a spinning wheel and a reel, and said, now set to work, and if by tomorrow morning early you have not spun this straw into gold during the night, you must die. Thereupon he himself locked up the room and left her in it alone. So there sat the poor miller's daughter, and for the life of her, could not tell what to do. She had no idea how straw could be spun into gold, and she grew more and more frightened until at last she began to weep. But all at once the door opened, and in came a little man, and said, Good evening, Mistress Miller. Why are you crying so? Alas, answered the girl, I have to spin straw into gold, and I do not know how to do it. What will you give me, said the mannequin, if I do it for you? My necklace, said the girl. The little man took the necklace seated himself in front of the wheel, and whirr, 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 three turns, and the reel was full, and he put another on, and whirr, 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 three times around, and the second was full too, and so it went, on until the morning, when all the straw was spun, and all the reels were full of gold. By daybreak the king was already there, and when he saw the gold he was astonished and delighted, but his heart became only more greedy. He had the miller's daughter taken into another room full of straw, which was much larger, and commanded her to spin that also in one night, if she valued her life. The girl knew not how to help herself and was crying, when the door opened again, and the little man appeared and said, What will you give me if I spin the straw into gold for you? The ring on my finger, answered the girl. The little man took the ring, again began to turn the wheel, and by morning had spun all the straw into glittering gold. The king rejoiced beyond measure at the sight, 
but still he had not enough gold. And he had the miller's daughter taken into a still larger room full of straw and said, You must spin this too in the course of this night, but if you succeed, you shall be my wife. Even if she be a miller's daughter, thought he, I could not find a richer wife in the whole world. When the girl was alone, the mannequin came again for the third time and said, What will you give me if I spin the straw for you this time also? I have nothing left that I could give, answered the girl. Then promise me, if you should become queen, to give me your first child. Who knows whether that will ever happen, thought the miller's daughter, and not knowing how else to help herself in this strait, she promised the mannequin what he wanted, and for that, he once more spun the straw into gold. And when the king came in the morning and found all as he had wished, he took her in marriage, and the pretty miller's daughter became a queen. A year after, she brought a beautiful child into the world, and she never gave a thought to the mannequin. But suddenly he came into her room and said, Now give me what you promised. The queen was horror-struck, and offered the mannequin all the riches of the kingdom if he would leave her the child. But the mannequin said, No, something alive is dearer to me than all the treasures in the world. Then the queen began to lament and cry, so that the mannequin pitied her. I will give you three days' time, said he. If by that time you find out my name, then you shall keep your child. So the queen thought the whole night of all the names that she had ever heard, and she sent a messenger over the country to inquire far and wide for any other names that there might be. When the mannequin came the next day, she began with Caspar, Melchior, Balthazar, and said all the names she knew, one after another. But to every one the little man said, That is not my name. On the second day, she had inquiries made in the neighborhood as to the names of the people there, and she repeated to the mannequin the most uncommon and curious. Perhaps your name is Short Ribs, or Sheep Shanks, or Lace Leg. But he always answered, That is not my name. On the third day, the messenger came back again and said, I have not been able to find a single new name, but as I came to a high mountain at the end of the forest where the fox and the hare bid each other good night, there I saw a little house, and before the house a fire was burning, and round about the fire quite a ridiculous little man was jumping. He hopped upon one leg and shouted, Today I bake, tomorrow brew, the next I'll have the young queen's child. <laughs> How glad I am that no one knew that Rumpelstiltskin I am styled. You may imagine how glad the queen was when she heard the name. And when soon afterwards the little man came in and asked, Now, Mistress Queen, what is my name? At first she said, Is your name Conrad? No. Is your name Harry? No. Perhaps your name is Rumpelstiltskin. The devil has told you that! The devil has told you that! cried the little man, and in his anger he plunged his right foot so deep into the earth that his whole leg went in, and then in rage he pulled at his left leg so hard with both hands that he tore himself in two. I hope you've enjoyed these tales, and have perhaps developed a new appreciation for the way horror has been a part of storytelling since long before it was an established genre. Terror is as much a part of life throughout history as death and taxes. Thanks for listening. The Dread Familiar was created by Joel Hackett. Tonight's stories were written by Jacob and Wilhelm Grimm. Good night.